No, I, I asked people for some questions, and, and one of the biggest questions that I got was the got them on the next sales. How, how many next sales were there? Uh, well, there were two different ones. The homeboys had their own. Uh, they had their own, which pretty much when I say the homeboys, uh, that was uh, uh, the people that was named in the uh, Live and Die uh, L.A. song. Uh, mine is probably Heron. I don't think Heron was was out there or had one. Um, and maybe Hen Dog. You know, I don't even know if he was mentioned in the Live and Die L.A. song. Uh, so about six or seven of the homeboys. Shug, Shug's radio talked to both security and and to the homeboys, and then my radio talked to both the homeboys and to security. But the homeboy security couldn't talk to the sec- you know, my security and my security couldn't hear things that was on the homeboy security radio. You got what I'm saying? Yeah. And then my security. What do you feel about? Go ahead. Let me let me finish the question. Then my security, uh, they had radios, and that was pretty much just the bodyguards, um, the guys that was working bodyguard details, not not the guys that was working in the clubs. So we probably had about six or eight. So each one of them probably had like six. Six radios, six to seven, six to eight radios on each side, and then mine and she can talk to both people. I can hear, I can go to one frequency, you know, one band, and can hear everything that the homeboy saying, and then I can go to the other band and hear everything that my security was saying, and vice versa for she. So is the Gotham story bullshit? That's such bullshit, man. I don't even think. And I knew something back then that I don't even think they had the capability back then to even um, do what he was saying that was done. But uh, 10 years later, you know, like I said, he came up with something in 2006. That's such bullshit. That's such, yeah. Why would that need to be said? Okay, who would I want to hear say that then? If I know all the homeboys can hear that, you think I'm going to have all... Should homeboys in on that? You think Buntry gonna be in, in on that? Or well, me, you know, hearing something like that, or, or, or one of his homeboys being the one to say that? And then you think one of my security guys, I, I'm gonna have them in on that? You know what I'm saying? It was six to eight that was just security had them, and then homeboys. Who who on the homeboy side I'm gonna trust to to, or I would have to have all six of them in on it to you know. You know, for for somebody to say that over the radio, everybody know who's on the radio and who who has them. So I well, the group all, to talk feature was. I'm sorry. I'm the sorry. group to talk feature was available in '96. That's so if Michael that Moore was the remember I said it didn't have the group the group thing. You only had the. I knew it was something. I said then that you didn't have that feature for next year, and that was the group thing. And so. Who would have did it? You know, who would have did it privately? So who who are we saying was involved? So are we saying one of Shug homeboys was involved with me? Or are we saying one of my security guys was involved with me? Who are we saying? David Kenner sure on the hell didn't have a radio. Sharita sure on the hell didn't have a radio. Who else was in the entourage? Only one that would have had it. Well, I guess it wouldn't have been somebody in the entourage. It would have been somebody in the car with Keefe D in there. I don't know. But that's such bullshit. I mean, that's. Bullshit, but that's Michael Moore. Ten years later, but everybody, even a year later after after all of that, was still was still cool. Even Frank, everybody think like I astronized Frank or something like that. Frank in his book tell you how I had him working at a. Even after all of that, even after him not coming to court, doing his job and testifying, I still had him working and still had him working over at a church detail. I had this big church that was getting repossessed. Where I had him just over there watching that property. So, so Reggie ain't this dude that, you know, that's trying to hurt people and and, and get rid of people. Why why did I keep Frank, you know, around if I if I thought he was trying to hurt or he was saying any things or, or this? People didn't do all of this and start creating all of this until later, until other people start getting in their ears and stuff like that. 
Why should why should people t- think that you're credible when you're arguably there for every meeting that happened at Death Row, including Del Rey Theater, Dwayne Bowdy, Stanley Brothers, and more his Omar Bradley too? And wait, you did wait, nothing to wait, stop wait, it. Wait, could you repeat that? What happened though? On the on the Bowdy thing? You said the Bowdy? Bowdy tried to come yeah, in with, I, with guns. He tried to come in and force his way in with guns, trying to be tough guy with some with, with some other uh, with an artist with a producer. And we tell him he can't come back there without getting patted down, and he's going to force his way in. I don't have that. I mean, you know, you stay back. He had guns on him. What did I do? Call the police, have him arrested, did what I was supposed to do. That's the type of dude I am. That's what I, that's what I do. Omar Bradley, what happened? Him and Shiv was out there slap boxing, playing around, and he got mad. Because she she got the, the best the best of him and they, they they took it a little bit serious playing around and then that's when they fall out. Omar Bradley only mad at me because then later on when he try to be gangster mayor or whatever and try to do stuff that he think he can do. No, I put money behind somebody else and he lost his seat. That's why Omar Bradley is bitter. Who's the other person name that you said? Those, those are two. The Stanley Brothers. The who brothers? The Stanley Brothers. I wasn't even around there. wasn't even around when that incident happened. I was probably, shit, what was that, 92, 93? I, I, was. I wasn't around there. I, I wasn't even working for Death Row there. Did they not get a judgment with your name on it? The Stanley Brothers? No. Yeah. That, that's the bounty, the... Uh, What's his name? That's the the Baldi or whatever his name was. The guy that tried to come in with with guns into the studio. That that wasn't allowed to do that. As a, as a way of putting it. But the Stanley Brothers, I didn't. Yeah. That wasn't even working. Wasn't even working with that from right away. They was at Solar Records then. I think you talking about ninety three. I didn't. I didn't come around until like uh, the murder was the case. What was that? Like the end of ninety four, ninety five is when I came around. Well, you made a comment that you donated to Paradin uh to out Omar Bradley. Correct. Why? Uh because uh uh number one, Omar uh uh tried to dis well he did disband the police department without doing it the correct way. He just did it with votes and um when he should have, uh, uh, was supposed to go to the people, and you're supposed to have their vote by the people, or the, the citizens of Compton. Um, and so I felt he was wrong for doing that, and I didn't agree with his politics, the, the way he was uh, handling the city of Compton at that time. And Eric Perrin was an ex-partner of mine, um, and I believe you know he was a deputy D- DA at the time. Well, he still is a deputy DA, and I believe he was better for the people of, of Compton. And that's why he's upset, because he knows that money that helped. Because in Compton, unfortunately, you know, there's only about 3,000 people that go and vote out of the whole 100,000 people. And most of them are old people, and they get those things in the mail where it's already checked. So they show you who to vote for, you know, to say, you know, vote Democrat or whatever, vote for this person, this person. And they take those things in the polling, in the, uh, in the polling, you know, booth with them and vote that way. And that's what got Eric Perrin over because I uh, gave him money to uh, mail that out to people, uh, and that got him over. And so that's why Omar been upset. Don't you think it looks suspicious though? Doesn't it look like a bribe to support a DA who prosecuted Nate Dogg and, and Snoop and they got off? I think that was later with the Nate Dogg. Number one, Nate Dogg wasn't even a death row artist at that time. Nate Dogg was gone to break breakaway. I think that was in 2002, 2003 when, when Nate Dogg got in trouble. So we didn't give a fuck about Nate Dogg yet. Nate Dogg, I sold Nate Dogg to break away in 1989, I mean 1998 or 1999. But the suit trial was in 95. The suit trial was in 95. He was, uh, Eric Perrin was probably still in law school at that time. That's why shit I always get mixed up and you know, with dates and stuff like that. You know, when people things look you know, look suspicious when it ain't. Eric Eric Perrin probably didn't run from mirror until about two thousand two, two thousand and three. These are people that were gone, long gone. 
uh, uh, Snoop at, in 2002, 2003 was hollering No Limit Soldier. What would we care about that? Other than we were still getting an override on him, we were making more money off of him then than, um, than, than we did with him as an artist. Because we had an override on him. On him. I guess the allegation, and i sorry to repeat myself, but the allegation is paired in, Snoop gets off, evidence comes up missing, and, and when he runs against Omar Bradley, he shut down the Compton Police Department. In right, fact, that's, that's the number one, Compton Police like Department. The Compton Police have, have had nothing to do with with the Snoop the Snoop uh, investigation because that happened in deep in L.A. in, in Venice, by Venice Beach, somewhere over there. Number two, like I said, that happened in, what, 93, 94? Eric Perrin was still a Compton Police Department, Compton Police officer then. I don't even think he had finished law school yet. As a matter of fact, I know he hadn't finished law school yet, or so he had just did, and, you know, Eric didn't finish law school probably until, like, 96, 97. Didn't run for mayor until about 2002, 2003. So that go that allegation. Nadal, so. Well, no affiliation with Death Row. 1997, 1998, gone. We'll break away. I think his trial or whatever he got, he was in trouble for it was in 2002, 2003. And so why would we be helping Nate Dog then? Now, he had that Taco Bell incident, but he beat that case. But that was in Long Beach. But he beat that case. That was in 95 or something like that on this song, One More Day, that he talked about. Or whatever, but that was ninety five, ninety four. Eric Perrin had nothing to do. You know, like I said, he was still a cop to cop then. So I think that shoot down that theory. Next. Well, didn't all the Compton PD hang out at the VFW behind Wilson Park, uh, across the street from Lady of Victory? Uh, not all of them, but the older ones they do on Friday night. The ones that drink. And do some of some of the older ones. They they did that. It was probably about four or five of them that did that. But no, not all of them. Not the ones that was beating the streets. Not the youngsters. Not the ones that was with us. We was out there trying to make money. I sure don't. I still to this day don't drink. I ain't never had no alcohol in my system ever. So I'm not one for hanging out at no VFW club or what, what they used to call T.I. Thirsty Owl or any places like that. That wasn't me. But none of the guys that worked for me are hung with me. But what that has to do with anything, if those, those, the older guys that used to drink at VFW, who used to hang up at the VFW? That was affiliated with Delta. Well, the, connect- <clears throat> the connection would be your father. Oh, my. Oh, okay. My dad definitely was the one for the VFW uh, hanging out there. He didn't drink like that. No. No. But. Even even so, even if he did, but he didn't. What 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 is that connection? I don't understand the VFW connection. Well, the the allegations that I worked, I worked at security prior to working for Death Row at the VFW. I used to pack pack guys down that came in, in there. I told you I was a I was a workaholic. I was a pretty much of a whore, working at all the different locations around. You know, security. I worked at the Compton Indigo. Uh, clubs at Ramada Inn uh, at the Greg Townsend Sports Bar when they had that going on at the hotel. So I, I worked security all over, all over um, prior to working for Death Row. Because in the course of uh, what is in Battle for Compton, mm-hmm. um, the the stuff that ties you, <clears throat> excuse me, the stuff that ties you in and the connections with your father is that there was a a principal in 1998 who was shot that was supposed to, that bullet was supposed to be for Omar Bradley. And the allegation is it was, uh, you were backing Paradin to uh, resurrect the Compton Police Department, which was shut down because of uh, cocaine's coming up missing from lockers that your dad was uh, actually indicated in. Now, what, what year was that? Now, you think the Sheriff's Department, let me just tell you, the Sheriff's Department did investigation or investigated all the cops that came over and and the dates, that's so we can get it right. The Compton Police Department wasn't shut down until two till two thousand and one. And two thousand one. So nineteen eighty nine or something like that. Or maybe you you mis or maybe I misunderstood you what the date, maybe you were saying ninety eight, I don't I don't know. But 
they did investigations on all those people that in 2001. And the chief of police uh, was was Harry Taylor. He was did apply for the uh, to be a captain at the sheriff's department. That p- position got held up. Uh, he didn't initially get hired by. He was one or two or three that didn't get hired by the sheriff's over on the lateral over. But they eventually offered him a job uh, uh, as a captain over there, which he turned down because by then he was uh, he was running the Compton Unified School Police um, Police Department, and he didn't want to be a sheriff after they found out and discovered what happened in the, the investigation uh, for the narcotics. I think a lot of this is being fueled by, you know, you've made you've made some comments about Frank Alexander and uh, Michael Moore. Mm-hmm. Russell Poole's family wanted to know how you found out about the details of Russell Poole's death and published it so quickly. Oh, my attorney, Robin Yanes. Uh, someone called him and told him about about the uh, incident, and he called me um, and said, "Hey, guess what?" And that's how it went. And then immediately after that, uh, uh, John gave me a call. I don't know how John, that's the question. That's the person you need to be asking how he heard about it so quick. He called me and asked me, and I said, and asked me, did I want to do an interview? And I told him, yeah, and, and, and that I had heard about it. You know, I kind of feel stupid now by saying, hey, it's a good day. That, 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 that was kind of fucked up. Um, but, Hey, this is the guy, man, when you at war with people, when people slandering your name and stuff. And, and I used to speak good about Russell. I used to always say, you know, Russell was just investigating. He was duped. I always just said he was a bad investigator because he was duped by Kevin Hackey and the Frank Alexanders and all of that. But I said one thing he never did was Russell Booth had been at my house and all of that on search warrants. Had been at the office and all of that. So he could have easily planted something that made me suspicious. But I always said the one thing I can say about Russell Poole, because he ain't never planted nothing to lie. He was a straight up cop. Um, it was just later when he started kept going and going and coming up with different theories when I started speaking negative on Russell. But prior prior to that, um, at first I never spoke negative on Russell. But when you just keep on, I mean, this patent theory is the craziest thing ever. It's the stupidest. It's just like you just this now you just in it for money, fame, or or whatever. The other things, you know, I didn't really speak uh, negative on Russell until he started with all of this, kept going and, and going and going. Russell just got obsessed with this. And that's why, you know, you, you don't retire and leave your police department because behind a case, you just move on to the next thing. You don't take shit personal as a cop. But he got obsessed with this stuff. And, and you just don't get obsessed like that. It ain't like he knew Tupac or... Or, or, or something like that, to, or, or not Tupac, or, or Biggie, or something like that, to be so obsessed with that. No, that's just because you're full of shit and you're ready to go, and you and you use stress retirements or whatever type of retirement to get out because you was ready to go. No, those that's what cops know about other cops. If you use stuff like that, it's just when you're at your wits and you're ready to get out of the business, and that's all that was. Russell wasn't wasn't married to none of this stuff. Like 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 he trying to portray, he wasn't. Well, to be fair, uh, Danny Patton, um, one of the people included in the Patton theory, was mentioned in Tim Brennan's original search warrant affidavit. Nobody knew who the hell they were. We still don't know. We we had never heard of that until you guys started promoting that. They ain't never heard that. Nobody ever heard that, to my knowledge. I never heard that until until that came out. And I remember it was a, a blogger by the name of Anton Bailey, ba- Bailey Anton Anton ba- Bailey or Bailey or something like that. That 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 yeah. tore up that. He's the first person to call me with it, but he had pretty much just approved it or disowned it uh, when he first heard about it. Um, I haven't heard from Anton in a while. I haven't seen him. I wish he surfaced back up because he was very thorough. But that was the only person that ever. Uh, uh, mentioned their names to me when it first came out, but but by then he had went and I think took pictures of the car and did all type of stuff. Him and uh, maybe him and Greg had started working together, or some him and somebody started working together where they just proved that whole theory. But 
Y'all you know, still ran with it. Uh, well, you know. Well, I think I think it's because of the evidence tied to Tim Brennan. Um, do you know Tim Brennan? Oh, I know Tim Brennan. I work with Tim Brennan. Well, I know Tim Brennan. Do you know why everybody I talk to about Tim Brennan, whose street name is Blondie, is afraid of him? Well, you said is afraid? Did you say is afraid? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, no, why? You tell me. No, no people, have, people have told me that he was known for shaking down drug dealers and planting drugs on other people. No, Tim didn't even work. Tim probably made... So many left uh, narcotic arrests because they were gang cops. They were homicide. I remember there was a show where said, "Hey, I don't give a fuck about narcotics. I'm a, I'm a murder police." Oh, that was my show, The Wire, uh, where Bunk say, "Bunk say, I'm a murder police." So that was Tim. Tim took guns and murder off of people. Now, probably when he was a street cop in the in the eighties, that's when uh, uh, DJ Quick made a song talking about Blondie and all of that. That was because he was deep in the motherfucker's ass. You know, in the eighties when Cocaine was running rapid in the city of Compton. But Tim became, he graduated from a dope cop to a, to a murder cop. And, you know, uh, and for white boys, those were two, him and Bobby Ladd were two bad cops. They worked and did a lot of, of good investigations and made a lot of things happen because dope and guns get you to other things. And so... They had informants in that city that was that made stuff happen, Mexicans and blacks. I mean, you know, city of Compton is a fifty-fifty city, but they were able to work work both sides, um, and they were two good cops. And um, to say it's dope, and man, it, it, you probably can count on your fingers the amount of narcotic arrests that Timmy that Tim Brennan made, uh, because he that that that's what he used. And gave guys breaks to to roll, and they and, and they owed him one. And guys do that. I don't care what you say, or what, what people know. Guys make things, and guys make cases for people. Police don't be sitting there and don't be doing all the thing. You watch Forty Eight Hours and all of that stuff. You make cases because people running their mouths, and other people running their mouths that make cases. Because the very it's very few times. When you have the resources, like the ATF, and they did on on me, where they can just sit and listen to your phone calls and follow you around. Only the FBI and the, 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 the three-letter boys, we call them, those agencies are the ones that have the time to work the cases like you guys think. Street cops and cops, they don't have, they, their stuff is mainly done by informants and, and people snitching. Um, so, you know, that jacket on Blondie or Tim Burton or whatever, that was old stuff. He didn't care about a dope arrest probably after the 90s, at least probably 92, 93. Once he got under my father t- tutelage and, uh, and started working the gang units and stuff with him. And it was about five or six of them uh, that worked that little gang unit, but they knew everything that was going on in that city. And their, their rate, their murder rate conviction was better than the sheriff's department that has all the resources now. You look that up and see if they're not about the same, their conviction rate and murder rate. So to say well, I know that Tim Brennan and, and uh, Greg Cadding aren't exactly on the same page. No, they wasn't because Kim uh, wanted, you didn't. Yeah, Tim wanted to do more of, um, uh, um, you know, more kick doors. He was a kick door, uh, go, go after people type of things where, you know, Greg and them was more about setting back. So they, like I said, I believe Greg and them followed me for about a year before they came knocking on my door. You know what I'm saying? Um, they were following people. They made cases on people. They made cases on people that was close to me that I knew. And, uh, you know, that you know, they worked for Defo and worked around Defo that they went after. So they were um, they were sent back for about a year or two. They had told me places and and places where I had been. When Sugar and I was hanging out in 2006, 2007, where we had did some talking to Babyface and Damon Thomas and stuff like that then, where they were pretty much sitting right next to us. And they was hoping we made some threats and did some intimidation to uh, to them at that time. Uh, so 
So they were they, they were around following where Tim Timmy Brennan was more of a kick in doors. <laughs> Let's just get people and you know get them the road. That's how he thought. Um, and the only reason things didn't happen was because Greg got in trouble behind that uh, that George. Um, What's that? That numero uno uh, pizza or numero uno? Uh, yeah, George Torres case where he messed up on. But um, if that wouldn't happen, it would have been interesting to see uh, uh, what would have what would have happened with that case. It would have been real interesting to see. I had a couple more for you if you had time. Really. Uh, but I told you I'm, I'm I'm a free book or whatever you. I want to clear it up. I want to try to convince you to show you that I'm not this dude that you think I am. Uh, and and it's mainly for not even so much you and definitely not for RJ, but because uh, I really believe that RJ is a, a racist. You know, especially after I heard him make that monkey statement, and I know you heard it too. I'm glad you pulled it down to save his face, but it came out. It's actually always, it's up on the page. It's up on my Patreon. He didn't say he didn't he, say monkey. Well, he did call him monkey. He said reading off the cards like a little monkey. That's what he said. Reading from the script like a little, and he almost said it again. Then he changed it to something else the second time when he did the interview, and the, and then the, the monkey word almost came off his lips again the second time. But hey, people are who they are. But anyway, you was about to ask me something else. Well, you you've done a couple. Television shows like Fox um, and A and E, obviously, you always seem to defer to to Greg Kading. Um, the murder out book. Yeah. You know, what? Why do? You, why do you defer, I that. defer I to Greg that in, Kading? I believe that investigation. I don't mean to just to single out Greg, but Greg the only one that did it. And you got to remember, the people that was on the task force with him hates him now. They hate Greg. Because he exposed and played this in, they spent three to four years investigating and doing all of this, uh, um, you know, doing all of this, and they still want to make something happen and do something. They they even tried to still take the case to the U.S. Attorney uh, on Keefe D. Even after that, because they feel he broke his uh, immunity agreement or whatever, and, and and they still wanted to do stuff. So those cops hate him, but everybody make it seem like it was this great theory. Greg was a lead investigator, but he wasn't a lieutenant or sergeant or anything. There was people that was over him like that. But he was a lead investigator. But he had an FBI agent on that task force, ATF, an IRS, it was, uh, about four LAPD cops, two sheriffs, plus Brendan was a sheriff at the time, even though he, he quit, you know, because he, he didn't feel like the task force was going in the direction that he wanted to go into. Uh, wanted it to go, so I think he he got off the task force. But there was still two, uh, uh, Mike Coed and his partner. So there were there were like seven to nine different other investigators that all still came up with the same conclusion. And 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 they not friends. The Timmy Brennan and them still to this day won't talk to Greg Kading. You know, so um, that's why I believe it. I mean, I believe their investigation. I know some of the players that was involved in the investigation. I believe what they said. I definitely believe the Keefe D thing because I believe that prior to that even, them even finding that out, I really believe that. So, that's why I well, referred to that, it. Huh? Well, Dad said that you were the guy that would have to go to the prison to see Suge to get artists paid. Is, is that correct? That's correct. I, I mean, uh, permission to do pretty much anything. I was uh, the day-to-day operation guy. I couldn't just make a decision. I couldn't just have a, a check cut for for you know twenty five, fifty thousand or whatever. I'll go up there, talk to him, and he'll say, "Yeah, Reg is cool. I would do that if I was you." It's usually what he would say because he wasn't supposed to be running the business or dealing with stuff. So he'll say, "If I was in your shoes, I would do that." It's pretty much was his his way of telling me it was cool to gave me his blessings. But I didn't have a stamp. I wasn't a check signature. I was just the person that go to the bookkeeper and say, hey, cut me a check for $25,000 or so and so. But then I had to, there was a couple of other people, uh, his dad, uh, Michelle A., and somebody else that I used to have to go to to get them to actually uh, sign the check or put a stamp on the check. So it wasn't like I could go and 
cut a check for X amount of dollars and and, and then stamp it myself. Uh, I, I didn't have that capability. But, yeah, I was pretty much the one that uh, you would go to to, uh, you know, to, to get the permission. They'd come to me and say they need this or need that done or whatever. And then I'll pretty much take it to him and get his, his blessings to do it. So that's pretty much how the operation worked. Well, in Greg Kading's book, he said that Suge Knight had to be killed uh, via payment from prison. How do you absolve yourself if you're the money guy? Because uh, Biggie got killed in March, what, March of uh, 97. I didn't take over yes. that responsibility until about July of 97. His, his brother-in-law, North Anderson, was in charge at the time. He said that uh, that you were providing information to his case. Who was? Um, you and Lloyd Lake. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Who was? Oh, uh, okay. Greg, Greg Kading. Okay. Greg Kading said that you were providing information to his case. To his in what year? I didn't meet Greg Kading until about 2008, 2009, when him and uh, Darren DeFree came knocking on my front door. Yeah, it, no, it's around that time. He said in a Hip Hop DX article. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the reason I'm saying. Go ahead. Well, they brought, the they, they, they questioned me. They questioned me and told me what they were trying to do, and I was just forthcoming on everything that I knew. I didn't know anything at that time about uh, any uh, uh, murder to Tupac, which they never asked me about because they feel that I think at that time they already had that pretty much solved. Uh, you know, but they were following KPD as well. Um, and then on the Biggie case, they really felt that uh, we had something to do with that, and. Uh, in the timeline, but I think once they learned what I just told you, that I wasn't really in that decision-making chair that I was in in 97, 98, I didn't get into that chair until about June or July 1997, where everybody thought I was pretty much was in that chair uh, when Biggie got killed, uh, which was uh, what, March, March of 97. And once they learned and they verified that I wasn't in that chair, I think they moved on to other people. So you think it's a bit hypocritical that you and Lloyd Lake did that project where you're calling Sugar Snitch? Isn't that what you're doing now? When I say he was a snitch, by saying what? What did what? I mean, what the Ice Cube thing? And that wasn't a that wasn't a dry snitching thing. I said it. I said, hey, I believe it was in murder row. I wasn't dry snitching. That was because Ice T didn't know the case. He think I was trying to throw shit under the bus. I wasn't throwing him under the bus. I was saying. I'm still saying I believe that to be the correct story. Uh, so that ain't dry snitching. That's there. That's a statement that I, I said. So you said I'm snitching. I've been saying this for the longest, that I believe the, uh, the investigation that the uh, 7 or 8 uh, LAPD task force or whatever task force they call themselves uh, did, I believe that to be accurate. And that's because of the players that's involved that um you know that got you know that got immunity you know there's people with immunity deals and all of that that's out there that 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 I know I know I I know you know things that don't happen so I know what you say. Well, speaking more along the lines, Greg, Greg Kading, not even the IC thing, Greg Kading said that you were, you know, instrumental in his case, building the Biggie case, mm -hmm. and uh, one of his main witnesses was oh. Teresa Swan. All right. Well, I was speaking more about Teresa Swan. Um, you were in a relationship with her? That was, uh, that was like uh, uh, Godmother of my child. That was a, a close friend. I didn't have no sexual or any type of uh, relationship with, with her or anybody that uh, that Suge was involved with. Suge have herpes, dog. Herpes. You think I'm going to be messing around with somebody that has herpes behind somebody? Well, court records show that you were evicted with uh, Teresa Swan. Hey, that no you lived together. Oh, okay. We literally know. See, I said, and I mentioned that earlier. 
I said that I rented house. I rented a house that somebody that his girlfriend was living in. Is what I said. I said that earlier in this interview. But that don't mean we were living together because I rented them. I had cars. I had the, the limousine that Mr. Lay was riding around in, too. It was in my name. So the building that, that Death Row was housed in, that was in my name. Uh, I think about five five cars. The car that Bunchy got killed in was in my name. The two or three Mercedes that Shug was riding around when he came home was in my name. You get the point yet? I do. Okay. Um, you you had said on bomb first this last interview with John uh, that you took a lie detector test. Mm-hmm. When was that? Uh, I don't know. That was doing the Greg Cadiz and them interview. Greg Cadiz and them was the one that uh, administered to me. The ATF in Riverside. Wow, that's huge. I didn't know that. Yeah. Tell you, there's a lot that y'all don't know. I'd like to give you the last word. Do you have any questions for me? Uh, no, this, you know, like I said, and, and the main reason that I wanted uh, Bomb First involved in it, it wasn't so much of the discredit of you. It's just that you have your A-man crew, <laughs> um, and so they're going to have their, their theories and their their questions and stuff like that, which hopefully we answer. And then, you know, Bomb First have people that, that, that believe his theories and and whatever he's doing, and then there's people that really who I'm doing it for is the fans that just want to know uh, the truth, and they want to answer all the questions. And I lately been trying to answer the questions uh, to people that that was on their mind that wasn't disrespectful, the people that come to, uh, you know, and put stuff out that ain't crazy. And I've been trying to respond to them lately, just because uh, number one, I I I despise your partner, um, just because of the way he comes off. Um, and, and so I'm just trying to set, set things straight. Uh, but, you know, if people got any questions, you know, I have to do it on the bomb first thing because a lot of the people that throw on his thing said every time that you and uh, RJ disagree with them, y'all got most of them blocked. <laughs> you know, when they can't respond or say something, y'all block them. So I just want to get both sides out there. And so I'm just pretty much telling you why, you know. You know, I didn't, didn't want to go straight to to you or anything like, like like I'm trying to hide anything or something like that, just so I can have it on both sides and people can you know conversate and, and, and take it where they believe uh, from from you know from you and then from me. So, um, but anytime you got any questions, you know, I hope um, you know some people think it's not me that's responding. That is me, the Reggie, right? And what you kind of threw out there, because you know it's been set up for a while. Uh, and, um, you know, that is me. And uh, if you got any questions, and you ain't going to be disrespectful, I'll respond. Anybody can be, you know, say stuff crazy over the Internet, so I don't even care about that anymore. But if you really want to know what went down or how it went down or you have some questions, just, just some ask, and I'll tell it. And if any time you got something that you want cleared up, cause I'm sure it's going to be some things that, Mr. R.J. going to have to say, I wish you would have asked this. I wish you would have said this. And when no things happen, you know how to reach out to me. You can hit me on Twitter or whatever, or hit me in the comment section, and I'll respond to it. Like I said, Jay, um, I have no real feels towards you, bro. I hate that you're telling people that I got to send people knocking at your door. You know it ain't no truth to that. Uh, I don't know why. I didn't say that. Oh, that's not what you said? Okay. I didn't say that. Okay. You said somebody. Another guy said that. Somebody else said I that. said that it was sense. But uh, I, tell, I tell you what, look, hopefully um, when these segments hit my channel and then hit Bomb first, the conversation we had can, can clear it up for people and let, and let them choose for themselves. Exactly. I really appreciate you taking it. Yeah. And, you know, I wish you – I wish that you get better. I wish – I don't wish you any ill health. I think that it's piss poor for people to do that. Uh-huh. And, you know, I wish you good health. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 thank God, you know, I think I, I, I crossed that battle. I got that fixed. And, you know, you know, I got a little case, and, you know, I know everybody likes to put me out like a rat, but trust me, 
y'all wouldn't be finding the information out that y'all finding out if I was a rat. And, uh, you know, the reason why I'm comfortable talking about it is because it's, it's just federal guidelines, and they can only do to me what they can do to me, you know what I mean? And so, um, you know, wish the best for that, but that's something i got to deal with. But that had nothing to do with my mentality in 1996, you know what I mean? Uh, that that you know that I did later, you know you got to remember out here in California, we almost look at marijuana as legal, <laughs> you know. But but that's that. Matter Thank you, Reggie. I agree. No problem, buddy. Good luck. Thank you. All right, buddy.